Greetings, fellow Homo sapiens, and welcome to the Symbiotic Podcast. We're here in our third season, streaming live from our studio uh, at College Heights in State College, Pennsylvania. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce you to our guest, uh, Dr. Stephen Schiff. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, Dr. Schiff is a pediatric neurosurgeon and brush chair professor of engineering here at Penn State. Great to see you, Steve. Good to see you too, Cole. So are you over your jet lag from coming back from Africa this latest time? Uh, mostly. I'm uh, still getting up at four in the morning each morning, uh, which does get me to start my day early, but it also ends pretty early. How often are you running back and forth to Africa these days? Well, before the pandemic, it was every three to four months. During the pandemic, I made it back once, and uh, then this was the first, uh, first more normal visit where we could get people together on this last trip. Right on. And, and uh, you have a long history in your life with Africa. Is that right? Can you, can you speak about that a little bit as we jump in here? Oh, you know, before we do, this is live. This is live stuff. I should let the audience know. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, for all of you watching out there, if you want to participate, um, please join the chat. You can put your name in there. You can stay anonymous if you wish. You can see the little chat box next to the live stream. And you can put your questions in there. Uh, you can also vote up other people's questions. And at the end of our conversation today, uh, we'll ask the, the top voted questions to Dr. Schiff uh, and you can hear his answers. Sorry about that, Steve. It's, it's live, no net. Here we go. So again, um, let's talk about Africa a little bit. Well, uh, my, I first visited Africa as a, as a boy uh, with my family and I, I was just fascinated uh, and it was so different from anything that I'd ever encountered here in the United States. And I had harbored this childhood dream that if I could ever go back and be able to do something useful and helpful to uh, people on that continent, that I wanted to do so. And so uh, later in my career, I found that opportunity. That's terrific. And, and how old were you the first time you went to Africa? I was 11. 11 years old. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's an interesting age. And was it for a good long chunk of time? I was in Africa for about six weeks then. and uh, But those memories as a child just stuck with me forever. Yeah. Cool. I, I, I went to Bumpus Mills, Tennessee as a six and seven year old. And those, those, that formed me as well, but maybe in different ways, but we don't, we won't go there. We're here to talk about you. <laughs> I have family in Tennessee. I understand. Uh -huh. Bumpus Mills, Tennessee in yeah. particular. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, <laughs> um, it's, it's been so great getting to know you a little bit in this last month, uh, as you've worked with, with the, the team here at the Huck Institute. So we got to learn more about your work and, and make the video that we're going to be showing debuting in, in a few minutes here for our audience. Um, it's just, Fantastic stuff. And, and to, to lead into that, I just want to remind all our viewers, you know, this third season we're doing of the podcast is about risk takers and game changers. And the reason we wanted you on the podcast is we feel you fit that mold of, of a scientist who's taking risks and really changing the game. And so I've been asking all, all of our guests, you know, were you always a risk taker? Do you consider yourself a big risk taker? Were you as a kid? Uh, I don't think so, except in one domain. Uh, when I was a kid, I was pretty good at ski racing. And you got pretty good at ski racing because you tended to take more risk, along with some skill, uh, than other people might have been willing to take. I say that now, it sounds like I was insane as a kid, but, you know, you kind of don't think that you can be hurt out there. And, <laughs> uh, I was actually a, a finalist in New York as a high school uh, kid, but... Too much of a nerd to make it much further than that and uh, eventually uh, stopped it because it seemed too risky. Too many other people were getting hurt. 
yeah, yeah, you, you, you can definitely hurt yourself. Yeah, my, my son went skiing for the first time recently and came back in one piece. No, no broken bones. We were very happy about that. And ski racing is by yourself, though, right? You never, you never see people skiing, like, next to each other. Oh, they do some of that these days. But in the classical forms of alpine racing, it's just you by yourself. Yeah, just try to get down there as fast as you can. Just, just a wild man. So you're a wild man on the slopes. Uh, well, not anymore. Uh, <laughs> although, you know, training as a physician, uh, especially uh, with things such as infectious disease, you learn how to control the risks of exposure and, uh, you know, keep yourself calm and faced with uh, people with uh, contagious and dangerous diseases. And it becomes something that you absorb professionally. Uh, and so that has helped, but I'm I'm a much more cautious person now than I was uh, as a teenager. Got it. Got it. Well, that's interesting. And, and um, I, I would say, you, you know, one thing we're fascinated in learning more about is what causes people in, in the scientific realm to take a risk. And, and I know that you are the recipient of two major NIH grants that are considered high risk, high reward Grants and here, you know, at the Huck Institutes, we've got a little seed fund that's called HITS, the, the Huck um, Innovative and Transformational Seed Fund, and it's supposed to be stuff that's too risky for the NIH to even look at, right? But but the NIH does have a program for things that they consider risky, and you're one of the few people that's that's hit it two times, not just once, which is pretty phenomenal. Like very very rare that somebody would would be given that kind of money. Two times. So, what's your magic sauce? Like, what what do what do you think uh, is going on there? The first time back in Africa as an adult, um, I visited uh, an old and very dear friend of mine who had moved to Africa and built a hospital. And I was amazed at the struggles and the types of disease that he he was treating, and perhaps searching. F- for good problems. I mean, if you're at a university and you're faculty and you're doing research, you can work on things that are of no interest to anyone, including yourself, or you could find things that are just the best use of your precious time on earth. And I asked him, he's Ben Wharf, he's now a, a, a professor at Harvard, very well known for his surgical work, and I said, what's the most important problem you can't solve? And he thought about it for a moment, and he said, maybe I could help figure out what makes thousands and thousands of these infants sick. And they had never been able to recover what organism gave these babies brain infections. Uh, And then in the survivors, they often needed brain surgery for the fluid that built up. And I thought, okay, how hard can that be? Right. (laughs) <laughs> Fifteen years later, you and I are now talking, and we're beginning to crack this problem open in a useful way. But faced with something that could be solved, but no one had, and from someone like myself who did not have a background you would have expected uh, to have been an expert on baby infected, uh, infected with organisms uh, that got into their brain, um, it was a struggle. So. This isn't like an airplane pilot where if that plane crashes, everyone on the pilot dies. Um, This is risky in the sense that we needed a lot of resources Mm. to crack this problem. Uh, We had uh, burned through uh, a number of different seed grants, which got us started, got us looking at some of these samples. But we needed a major investment, and there was no expectation that this would succeed, but the NIH, and very thankfully the NIH director, uh, decided that this was worth the risk, that Mm -hmm. we would fail, because if we could succeed, uh, it was a huge impact and potentially one that had global impact around the planet. So you feel it was that potential impact that was the, moved the needle for you, so to speak? Definitely. Uh, and the same story for the, the second one of these um, uh, grants that we received. Um, we had been the only pers- the only people, really, in that space working on these problems. Um, 
part of that is is a cultural and political issue around the world. Uh, we testified to Congress about 10 years ago on the fact that these newborn infant infections were unstudied, uh, uncharacterized, and were killing about a million babies a year around the planet. And wow. much more than many of the other diseases that we put enormous resources into, such as malaria. We, uh, we put some of that footage in, in, in our video, uh, which uh, we're, we're very proud that, that we were able to try and condense. That was the hard part, was condensing in, into five minutes um, all these different pieces of, of what you've been doing for 15 years, right, uh, at, the, at this stage. Um, and we're going to cue that up in a minute so, so folks can see. And <laughs> some of what you, what you just shared is in the video, but it'll be nice to just have that out to the world to, to get that, that story out there, which I think is, is really important. There's so much good work going on that people don't know about, right? Um, and I think that making more people aware of what the problems are and how big the problems are uh, can only help to, to muster more support um, in the public and hopefully with, with lawmakers and, and you know, institutions like the NIH, et cetera. So um, why don't we go ahead and cue that up? And, and I'll just remind everybody, if you have any questions as you listen to Dr. Schiff and, you, and, and you, there's anything you want to know as you watch the video, as we, as we go through the Q&A here, um, with, with myself uh, and Steve, uh, you can ask your questions too. You can just pop those in the chat and we'll get to those a little later. So at this point, Dan, if you're ready, we could uh, queue up that video and we'll take a little look at uh, our latest Life From All Angles featuring the work of Dr. Stephen Schiff. If you've ever watched a medical drama, you might recognize these. They're MRI scans of human brains. The scan on the left shows the brain of a healthy infant from Uganda. But in the scan on the right, there's this circle. It's an abscess, a fluid-filled swelling. All of these scans show them too. These abscesses are linked to a condition called hydrocephalus. It affects more than 400,000 newborn children around the world each year and could lead to cognitive issues, brain damage, and death. What causes these cases of hydrocephalus in the African nation of Uganda is at the center of a medical mystery that tells us a lot about how global health works and can be improved. Hydrocephalus is a condition where you don't clear the fluid that is made in your brain every day and helps nourish it and suspend it uh, adequately. And in a young baby, uh, the fluid builds up in the head because the bones of the skull are not yet fused. The head gets large. Stephen Schiff is a pediatric neurosurgeon and Brush Professor of Engineering at Penn State. He's leading a global effort to better understand and treat childhood diseases in general, and hydrocephalus in particular. So we think that upwards of a million infants a year die in the first month of life uh, around the planet from infection. In 2007, Schiff spent a week in Uganda to help address technical problems with diagnosing epilepsy. He examined the equipment and made some professional connections, but what really caught his attention was the number of babies he encountered with enlarged heads. At the end of that week, I asked my colleague, well, what's the most important problem that uh, he needed help solving? And he said, well, why don't I try to figure out what makes these infants sick? I thought, how hard could that be? And here, 15 years later, we're finally getting answers to that. The doctors in this hospital had treated over a thousand cases like this without ever knowing the cause of the condition. To gain some clues, Schiff turned to genomics. There's a piece of a gene that all bacteria have that we have large databases for. So if we sequence pieces of that, we often can determine pretty close what the species is. Working with an international team of colleagues for over a decade, Schiff discovered that almost all the hydrocephalus in Uganda was caused by one organism, a specific variant of the bacterium Painobacillus thiaminolyticus. It was never known to cause serious illness. If we offer it to mice, the strain that we knew well doesn't hurt them. The strain from the African infants kills them usually in a day or so. It took more than $4 million and over a decade to identify and characterize a single pathogen in Uganda. Until similar work is performed in every low- and middle-income country, Schiff points to the promise of highly integrative prediction techniques to help reduce the burden of infection on infants globally. 
And although in the future, I think we're going to be able to have new technologies that enable us to do a much better job of determining what makes an individual sick from a given bacteria or a virus, today, a workaround is what we call predictive personalized public health. The key, says Schiff, is to cross-reference relevant data streams, including location of infections, prevalence of specific bacteria in specific places, and environmental factors like rainfall, temperature, and humidity. By combining satellite data with on-the-ground surveillance over time, this novel approach could empower doctors to far more accurately diagnose patients at the point of care. As he testified to the House Foreign Affairs Committee in 2011, Schiff sees this work as a moral imperative. As a physician and scientist, and as a father, I'm struck by how much we don't know about newborn infections in developing countries. I am concerned that one reason is that the newborn infants who die there have no political voice. Schiff is quick to point out that none of the work he's doing would be possible without scores of people willing to cooperate in pursuit of a higher purpose, something bigger than anyone's individual career. We put 50 people on some of these scientific papers. You can get buried in the large numbers of names that are credited with authoring these discoveries. But people really surprise you. And faced with a project worth doing, I've been just so proud that the teams we've put together uh, are just as dedicated today as they were when we first asked, would you be interested in? You know, it's funny, you tell people, we got a lot of, we have thousands and thousands of infants dying in, these, in some of these sites. Uh, would you want to help us? And I usually don't get to finish the sentence before most folks who I would approach will go, I'm in. What do you need? And that's, that's part of the reason I think we're doing a good job. To keep up with the latest developments in Dr. Stephen Schiff's work, along with other scientists at Penn State's Huck Institutes of the Life Sciences, visit huck.psu.edu slash subscribe. Great story, Stephen. Yeah, we're so proud to be able to work with you and, and help more people uh, see what, what you're up to and all the people you're working with. Um, you know, you just sent me a new photo today that we're going to put in that video when we when we put it out as a separate piece. The big team, it just that was taken like last week, right? All those folks that, that have come together. And I love when you shared that, you know, people just step forward because they want to make a difference. They're inspired by, you know, something bigger than themselves. You know, that, that's that been a theme for all of our guests here is this idea that, you know, it's not just science for science sake, although that can be inspiring as well, but science that makes a difference in the lives of other human beings is really powerful stuff. And thank you for, for doing that. I, I used to think that uh, it was a personal decision of, on my part to focus on children's medicine because uh, originally I, I had trained as an adult surgeon. and uh, But dealing with infant disease is just universal around the world. It doesn't matter uh, what the politics are in a government or between uh, different political factions. It's one of the great unifiers of humanity. And uh, I, I just think I'm very lucky to be able to wake up each morning and work on problems like that and with so many people who uh, are so dedicated to working with us. Yeah, that's that's a good attitude to have. Yeah, I think that, that meaningful work inspires us to keep going. <laughs> well, it's also important, I think, Cole, uh, in a university. Mm. So we train a lot of uh, students at the graduate level, either to work in industry or government or uh, the majority uh, to go into academics. And I tell them there's no difference, so far as I'm concerned, between the three different domains we're supposed to introduce them to, uh, research, education, and uh, service. And if we pick the right domains to work on, it all blends into one. And I, I tell my grad students, you know, if, don't waste your precious life on anything you don't really believe you should be working on. 
Yeah, that's great advice. That's great advice. Well, as you mentioned, the next generation of scientists, you're reminding me that there's a component to your work that includes bringing knowledge, not just technology and knowledge, but also starting programs in the countries where you're working. Could you speak about that a little bit? So we try very hard, uh, even when they're not designed, the grants are not designed to build capacity, uh, to build capacity. Um, a lot of the science in developing portions of the world has, for better, uh, uh, better or worse, and for lack of a better phrase, been called colonial. We come in from Europe or from the United States uh, with clever ideas. We do research projects. We leave. And the goal in all of our work is that when we're done, um, that the people in the countries facing the problems that they face that are currently insurmountable will have the skill and the capacity and the training to take up the work themselves and to deal with future problems. What does that look like on the ground? Well, we put teams together uh, to not just do the work, but to be research units. Uh, so we have a very good research unit um, at one of the hospitals in Uganda that we actually we uh, piece together from three different NIH grants, both grants here at Penn State and also grants uh, at Boston Children's Hospital. Okay. And uh, I probably have helped half a dozen uh, students at the graduate level now get their master's or PhDs uh, mostly in Africa, but we, we do work closely now with a graduate student from Vietnam, another site that NIH has encouraged us uh, to branch off to. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit, because you've been in Uganda largely there for a good long time, kind of proving things out, and, and the, the bacteria that was mentioned in our, our video, which I want to revisit in a minute, but... Um, that's been the core, and you've learned a lot, but now you can kind of take that model and go to other places. So where, where is it taking you? Um, so pediatric neurosurgery has about 100, 150 uh, certified practitioners in, in the United States. It's a pretty small club, mm -hmm. and we basically know each other. So in, within that group, we also know closely those who were deeply embedded in working uh, in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, and so the, in the same way, I was introduced to uh, some of the pediatric neurosurgery problems uh, and diseases in Uganda. I had colleagues, uh, oh, several colleagues uh, from the University of Alabama who've been very uh, intercalated into training and education of neurosurgeons in Vietnam, and uh, when you walk in, the first day I walked into an operating room in Hanoi, I saw exactly the same type of case that we've been trying to understand in Uganda. Oh, wow. And what I, I propose to NIH is that we don't know if it's the same organisms, but if we're going to make sure the strategies we're using in Africa are universal, then uh, an Asian side such as that was uh, ideal, and yeah. they agreed. That's terrific. So that's scaling up now? Uh, we actually, during COVID, it was very difficult. Uh, it was very difficult to get in and out of almost any country sure. for periods of time. Uh, but uh, with good teams in place, we continued and finished our recruitment of patients and our sampling of infants from Vietnam. A few, a few months ago, we got about 500 frozen specimens sent to us here at Penn State, and we're feverishly working on uh, analyzing them uh, to begin to answer some of the questions you probably would like to ask me. Yeah, well, um, you sort of mapped out your methodology, is my understanding, in Uganda, and I want to hear about the, the difficulties that, that you encountered 
uh, bringing those samples into the lab because we, we talked about that in our interview. There wasn't enough uh, time to get it into a five minute video, but I'd love to hear you recount that story a little bit of, of the specific challenges that you encountered uh, when trying to find the, the cause, that bacteria that was the cause of hydrocephalus in Uganda. Uh, originally, we tried using very inexpensive methods. They're forensic methods. The police use these uh, mm -hmm. here where you'd take some blood and you'd put a few drops on a, a filter paper card and then you dried it out and uh, put it in a FedEx envelope and mailed it. Um, there are some molecules that survive that fairly well, but the quality of specimen that we needed to accomplish what we ended up accomplishing needed to either be flash frozen at such cold temperatures that everything would be preserved, or um, they would be placed in preservative and still kept cold, uh, but there are special preservatives for molecules now, DNA and RNA, uh, that are the molecules that either code for our lives or for the bacteria and parasites that we find in the babies, as well as the next molecule they cr that the DNA is translated into. Uh, which helps code for the proteins that, that give us life. So yeah. um, those two methods required a cryogenic infrastructure be set up. Originally, especially in regions where the electricity supply isn't great, uh, we did this with liquid nitrogen in giant thermoses called dewars. And in, often there was no known supply of liquid nitrogen uh, available in the country, but some of our colleagues were extremely good at making sure they could find liquid nitrogen when we needed it. And it's those human touches that ensured that we could be successful. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, or in the video, uh, this whole procedure, setting up an infrastructure, currying thousands of tubes uh, overseas with um, the the shippers that we use are liquid nitrogen based. They can go in cargo on airplanes, mm -hmm. uh, but they only last about six days before they thaw. And I think all of them ended up coming in about five days and 12 hours oh. into the trip. <laughs> um, so uh, it was pretty nerve wracking. Yeah, but, high stress situation. But we got everything yeah. here. And uh -huh. then we've spent literally years uh, carefully preparing, sequencing, analyzing. The analysis is very difficult. So I was giving a talk at NIH once, and I said, at this point, uh, this is the current technology. And you could give me large grants to go into every impoverished country on Earth and try to do the same work. Um, but it doesn't, what we've done doesn't scale. It doesn't broadly disseminate, not with current technology. So the other approach, which we're very vigorously working on, is taking this kind of surveillance mm -hmm. and producing models to forecast. If you know where a baby comes from and when the infant got a bad uh, illness in the first few weeks of life, we appear to be able to do a reasonable job of predicting what the likely organisms are and therefore what the doctors at the hospitals and clinics should choose that week for their first line uh, antibiotic treatments. Right, right there at the point of care to exactly. make sure it's the correct medication. Exactly. Today, all over the world, Infants who come in with a very severe life-threatening infection in the first few weeks of life are all recommended the standard treatment of two old, inexpensive antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And it works for some of them. But the death rate and the damage rate under that type of treatment is far too high to be acceptable. And uh, we can do a much better job. And that is what we called in the video. It's it's predictive, personalized yeah. public health. Is it's it's all that data just layered on top of each other to 
comes down to like where's this baby from and then you start to collect you know what are the the, the different causes of the infections in the different parts of the world based on rainfall and all these environmental factors correct the basis to all of that call is surveying just like we surveyed patients with the different COVID-19 variants right um, for babies with bacterial and parasitic and viral infection you can make a map and if that map were static in time, it would be easier. But right. many infectious diseases fluctuate right. with the environmental conditions. In East Africa, in the highlands, you get two rainy seasons a year to worry about. Mm. And we're picking up these rainfall links. Many bacteria come from soil, for instance. Many come through insect vectors. Right. All of that, conditions in soil, breeding of insects, all of that is dependent on environmental factors. And all of it can be put into the same framework we use to predict the weather. Got it. Yeah, good use of technology. Well, at Penn State, we also have the great benefit of really high-class meteorology and geography and statistics. And these are problems nobody solves on their own. Right. I'm, I'm here, if anything, uh, the spokesman for a fantastic group group of people who work together as one. Uh, these are problems which demand uh, that people from many different disciplines are brought together. So I would like to, uh, to think, and, and I think it's true, that our meteorology that we're doing to understand African weather patterns uh, is just as good as the infectious disease genomics that we use to identify what the organisms are. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir here because at Huck, that's, that's our core belief. That's really what I think the, the Huck exists to do uh, in the life sciences framework is to bring the disciplines together and, and make a, a bigger map. Or uh, Troy Ott, who, who helps run our um, graduate programs, where, where our graduate students go to all these different disciplines too, uh, we had this mapping conversation recently. He said, no, at the Huck, it's more like we're making the maps. He's like, we're out there following the rivers and like chopping down some, like, you know what I mean? I, I, and I, I would consider you one of those path makers, right? You, so you, you're going to go in a new place and, and new maps will be built to, to follow what you're doing. And to your point, it's not going to be one person doing it. It's going to be a whole lot of different folks um, making a map that, that just didn't exist before the data has never been brought together, the the teams have not been brought together. That's what's so exciting uh, for us working at the Huck is, is seeing folks like you and tell, telling these stories. Um, I I know it's about twelve thirty right now, and uh, we, we've got about fifteen more minutes together. I think I'm going to join into uh, the chat here and see if we've got any questions uh, that people have put in. Oh, here we go. Well, we definitely have some questions. Um, oh, ask. So right now, reduce the number. Now that you have, oh, great question. Great question. I had this one in my mind too. So Kenny asks, now that you know what bacteria is causing these infections, what interventions or precautions, if any, can be taken to reduce the number of them? Oh, great question. Uh, that was several hours of morning discussion with colleagues both here in the U.S., U.K., and Africa. Um, there are, uh, broadly speaking, you divide this into two domains. Um, when an infant hits the clinic door and is sick, um, how can you better treat them? For an organism that we have no experience treating in the past, there's one known case recently published of this organism, and that was a post-mortem examination of an infant who had died. And so the, what, what we literally spent last weekend doing in Mbali, Uganda, gathering all of our physicians and investigators together is what evidence do we have that we can bring to the table to uh, make a guess at best practices, that is, which antibiotics and for how long. And since we've never looked at this before, randomizing that first guess against our second guess, as long as the 
we have no reason to think one is more uh, effective than the other, is begin to see which two paths might give better outcomes, then pick the best path, and then try variations of that. Again, seeking to both cure these infections before they uh, uh, cause major damage or kill the infant. And of course, we'd also like to prevent this very high load of infants that survive, but then need brain surgery in order to clear the fluid that builds up. What you'd really like to do, though, is prevent the infection. Right. So part of this conversation is how broadly do we have to sample uh, soil, water supply, animal products? Uh, is it in the mothers? We've done a maternal trial. Sampling mothers at the time of birth failed to find any evidence that this one bacteria is maternally transmitted, uh, but that doesn't mean uh, it's not going on either in certain cases, uh, because in many other illnesses that in, where infants get infection around the time of birth, most of these babies get sick in the first week. And uh, so we do have to worry about their home environment and whether any of this is transmitted because the mom carries the bacteria or other pathogens with them. Right. And so all of this uh, over the next several years uh, will require new, uh, new funding streams, which we'll raise, and then gathering the teams and effort together to, to do those steps. Thank you. I'm going to uh, hit you with another question. This comes from Anonymous. Uh, it, if you solved all the infant infection problems, what other kind of research would you be interested in doing? Boy, that <laughs> all the inf <laughs> all well, the infections. <laughs> well, I've worked on controlling uh, uh, seizures and spreading depression, which is the mm. uh, uh, one of the triggers for migraines uh, and cerebral palsy spasticity in children for many years. And if I did solve all of the infections, what I really do know something about. Uh, won't be solved, and uh, I would put a lot of time into that. Got it. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting one, also anonymous. It says, what subject area has been the hardest to pick up after shifting from surgery to this research? I, I, I think the hardest part is all of the changes in our understanding of the genome. Mm. Um, it, I wake up, I think, every morning wishing I knew more. But so do my colleagues who do that for a living. It's such a fast-breaking avalanche of knowledge mm. about how we are encoded and what we do with those codes. Do you think that AI has a role to play there in, in managing that, that avalanche of data? Do you, do you think that... It's the universal question, right? Cole. Yeah, that's... I mean, we all, <laughs> all of us who... Are, are a little older, we all got taught to model things, you know, like Newton modeled throwing a ball. Uh, you know, you come up with first principles and you study it for years and you understand gravity and you write down simple equations. AI has proven again and again that it can do things with understanding physics and biology and public health in ways that even if we don't understand completely what the computer's doing, look, I want results. Right. And uh, we, uh, we, we heavily use artificial intelligence and machine learning in almost every domain that I work on now. Yeah, that, that's a critical one in terms of the disciplines coming together, just uh, coding and, I mean, God, the digital, the digital world we're living in that going back to our, our digits in our hands right that's always every once in a while that hits me the did because we're using our little fingers and being digital like that i'll that date thing. myself <laughs> when i was in college they had the first teletype to ah. a computer at dartmouth where you could enter lines of simple code and it would spit back answers it was a programming language called basic oh and I used to crawl up to the one room in the department that had one of these, and it was just amazing that you could do such a thing. Now our students not only come with complicated machine learning 
network architectures that I honestly have no idea other than magic how they pull that one off. <laughs> and the next morning they come in with a web app yeah. and go, oh, yeah, I took that thing. And uh, if you want to post it on the website, anyone in the world can now upload their data and it'll spit out the answers. And I go, oh, sure. Why yeah. not? Yeah, why not? Go ahead and uh, pop that out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, those moments can give you hope, you know, because we, yeah. we hear a lot sort of in in the mainstream and in the media about like the evil stuff that can happen with social media and, and, and misinformation and people getting depressed and upset and jealous of one another and body image. Pro there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot in the media about the, the dangers uh, of tech. Uh, but there's also amazing stuff going on on the flip side. Um, and I do feel that the, the global community of, of scientists, wh when they do get together on something, it's incredible the potential of, of what, what we might be capable These of. These are together. tools, Cole. You can use tools for good things and bad things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, let's see. Oh, I've got one other question, and then um, we're, we're going to have to start to wrap up. I have a fun, a fun way that we wrap this thing up, but I'm going to ask one more question. This is from Sam. It says, now that you've identified the bacteria, where do you think it is coming from in the environment? This will be our last audience question. Sam, I'll give you my best guess, but a warning, every guess that I've made about what I expected to find working in Africa has, have all been wrong. But my <laughs> guess is that this is a soil organism. It lives next to, on the tree of life, similar organisms or soil organisms. It's, it, it infects the babies when the rains come in, not during the dry seasons. Um, that's my guest today. And so you'll be you'll be proving that out or disproving that out on the next phase of the work. Ask there. me in a year. In Cole. a year. Okay, we'll come okay. back in a year. Okay, speaking of coming back later, um, this is how we like to go out uh, this season. Uh, you may have noticed we have some friends here. We're not alone, and maybe we can cut wide and Dan can show who we have with us today. Uh, we mentioned this on every episode. This is just, just so that we don't get too serious about you know all, all, all the perils of, of life on earth. Um, I consider this, I've been meditating on it lately. I feel like it's, it's, it's one way that we can contribute to the diversity of, of, of Penn State in, in, in a different kind of way than people are used to thinking of. And that is the diversity of plushies that you can get in the world today that are Penn State. Each one of these plushies has, has a Penn State um, logo on it. And um, Dan's going to queue up in a second uh, a, l a little video that we made about the plushies. And I, I see this as the evolution of Penn State. You, you no longer are, are limited just to the, the Nittany Lion plushie. Uh, if you were to go, and these are all available at stores right here uh, in State College, PA, uh, you, you can get a llama plushie, um, you can get a gnome plushy Penn State plushy you can get the little baby bear plushy which I, I like to call the the infant indoctrination bear because it's making <laughs> growing the next generation of uh, Penn Staters uh, to, to, to grow up uh, with some allegiance to to old blue and white and you can even get yourself a beautiful pink horned unicorn plushy and so uh, we'd like to end every episode by letting our guests um, vote for whatever their favorite plushie is. So if you go into uh, the chat, there's a little button where you can vote and it's, it, it asks you which alternative plushie is your favorite. Uh, do you like the llama? Do you like the gnome? Do you like the bear? Or do you like the unicorn? And everybody loves the Nittany Lion. So we, we don't have the Nittany Lion as a choice because that that's that's a given. We all love the Nittany Lion. But, um, you know, we're, we're, this is our own research project, Steve, is that we're, we're going to collect the data on every episode of the podcast. And um, we're going to see how the audiences stack up. For instance, Nita Barty was on last week. I think that the llama was, was, the, was the number one plushy choice of that audience. Uh, for David Hughes, I believe it was the gnome, if I'm not mistaken. And we're going to see what your audience thinks. And I'm going to ask you directly, uh, do you have a favorite alternative plushie? If you wanted to take one of these home oh. to your office or off to Africa on your next trip, uh, which, which plushie would you go for? I'd have to pick the gnome for two reasons. Okay. It's kind of a homely looking creature. <laughs> and um, he always wears a hat in the sun. Oh, he's wears it. I've seen the pictures of you in the hat. You've got the African travel hat. I, I swear I burn in about five minutes in the equatorial sunshine. So, oh yeah, boy, I, 
That's I a, keep extra hats in case I lose one. You got a backup hat. Yeah. That's good. So, so you're a gnome man. <laughs> Duly noted. I believe uh, David Hughes was a unicorn g- man, and uh, Nita, I think, went with the llama. She showed, she, although she liked the, the unicorn as well. And so, um, you know, as we go out, we'll, we'll be sharing those with you folks out there watching. Uh, we'll see how this all turned out. And at the end of the season, we'll be back in touch with you uh, with a report that you can share uh, with, with colleagues and, and, and let them know how you stack up plushy wise. I'm sure that's going to be really important to you in your future career. Well, thanks very much, Cole. <laughs> I look forward to that. Well, I, I, in all seriousness, thank you so much, Steve. It's, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, getting to learn a little bit more about your work. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. You're one of those people that makes me uh, proud of Penn State, oh. proud to be here. And uh, let's let's keep in touch. We'll be following along. And and if if you saw the video, if if you want to follow along uh, with with Stephen Schiff's research, uh, you know at the Huck we 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 do like to share news uh, as things go on. So you can um, subscribe uh, if you go to huck.psu.edu/slash/subscribe. Uh, you can get our Pulse E newsletter about not just Dr. Schiff, but all the all the amazing scientists at the Huck Univ- uh, excuse me the Huck Institutes here at Penn State. University, I'm running out of time, but I want everybody to know if you come back uh, in a month on Thursday, April 28th, we'll have uh, Dr. Laura Wyrick on the podcast talking about ancient microbiomes and ancient DNA uh, and some fascinating stuff. So again, thanks a lot, Steve. Take good care. Everybody out there, thank you for watching the Symbiotic Podcast and don't stop co-evolving. 